Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Bowen Oliver Oration. It's one of the, the most significant and inspirational events that we have on our annual Samri calendar. Um, we're gathered today on the traditional lands of the Ghana people, um, Nainari, Pete, Manachi, and MacDonald, uh, Nyadlu Tumpanthi, Nyadlu Ghana, Yadanka, Imperenthi, Nyadlu Tumpanthi, Nyadlu Ghana, Burkiana. Um, what I've just attempted to say in Ghana language is that uh, we acknowledge and respect the, the lands of, of the Ghana people and, and the Ghana elders also. Um, we're here to honour the life of Bowen Oliver. Bowen was a vibrant, inquisitive young man with a passion for life. Aged just six, he was diagnosed with a rare disorder, MPS6, which at the time meant he faced a relatively rapid decline, including skeletal malformations, stunted growth, heart and lung problems, sight issues, and potentially cognitive decline. Bowen's parents, David and Christina, who are with us here today, um, at the time they received the diagnosis, there was not much in the way of treatments really to offer hope. Within three years, hope arrived in the form of a drug, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Um, the drug was the brainchild of Emeritus Professor John Hopwood, who is also with us here today with his beautiful wife, Barbara, um, and they are a, a, a massive part of um, why we have this event and, and how we have this event each year. Once on the trial, the Olivers saw an almost instant improvement in young Bowen's health and vitality, their son, who was having all areas of his life impacted by this disease, um, suddenly was regaining his physical and mental exuberance before their eyes. The treatment that John and his team developed has since helped thousands of people across the world, but that's a story for another day. Today, we focus on Bowen's story and Bowen's legacy. At the age of 20, after reclaiming his life from MPS 6, Bowen passed unexpectedly. From the age of nine, though, when he entered the clinical trials until his passing, Bowen made the most of every moment. To share more, more about those years and why we're here, please welcome David to the stage. I feel like you've copied my notes. Is that possible? Um, on behalf of Christina and I, we'd also like to thank the traditional owners of the lands where we are and extend our welcome to you all this evening for this 2023 Bowen Oliver Ration, which uh, is a bit of a sweet event for us, but it is a fantastic opportunity to talk about the story of Bowen and the importance of all the work that's happening here above us. Um, Peter alluded to, I'm going to repeat some of that, I'm afraid. Bowen was born in 1993. He's our third son and the younger brother to Michael and Christopher. We live in Sydney and uh, as he was born, we were busy building a home, watching our children grow and, like everybody else, the time fills with school and sport and our passion of going camping. We'd uh, noticed issues arising with Bowen as he grew, but you know, they were all sort of isolated, separate events that weren't really obviously strung together. Um, but as the boys grew, we became more and more aware that Bowen was just not meeting the same milestones in the way that they did. Uh, Christina, persisted with a number of specialists over almost a year or two of trying to get the message through to them that things weren't right. Uh, and in 1999, so when he was six, we ended up at the Children's Hospital at Westmead in Sydney with a diagnosis of MPS 6. So Bowen was six and our other two weren't much older, they were seven and nine. So this is early in our family's time. With that diagnosis, we had a very rapid adjustment to the new reality of our lives. Um, we knew nothing of that disorder or any of the other similar disorders that are out there in that, in that range of, of diseases. And at the same time, we're trying to learn about that. We're trying to shield our children from what we were finding out and what we then knew would lay ahead. Uh, and this was, of course, in the early days of the internet, so that was came along almost at the right time. So we searched a lot for information, we found support groups, 
and we crossed our fingers and hoped for treatments. So the year later, 2000, we were at an MPS conference in Coffs Harbour and met for the first time John and Barbara Hopwood. At the conference, we were off busy with all the parents with those disorders, learning about information and counselling and finding out what was the story. Um, but while we were doing that, Bowen was simply out on the children's program, having a fantastic time uh, and absolutely winning the hearts of everybody he met. And that was pretty much the story for the next 10 years. We did the hard work and he was just having fun and charming the pants and dresses off everybody he met. It was a tricky balance, but we uh, wanted to get involved. Uh, we wanted to gather as much information as we could, uh, but tried to have a normal, healthy family life as best we could. Um, but two years later, we were here, here in Adelaide, and we met the research team. Uh, Bowen was age nine, and he was enrolled into the clinical, the clinical trial for the development of the treatment, Nagelsine. It was like a dream came true before we could even know it. Um, I can't explain how much that meant to us. And really at that point, at this point, and I said it before, I know, but we really want to give our thanks <clears throat> and gratitude to the perseverance that went into all those years of dedicated research that developed that treatment because, you know, we didn't know it at the time, but that had been going for decades before Bowen was born, before we were married, before he was even thought of. And that hard work, we had just arrived at just exactly the right time. It was, it was a dream come true. <clears throat> so during the course of that trial, Christina and Bowen spent a lot of time here in Adelaide. The treatment showed great results almost immediately, almost from the first day. And Bowen's was and still is a great story of hope for everybody. We formed a really close association with the clinical, with the trial team, sorry, and got this very um, rare insight into the work that the researchers were doing on our disease and, and other diseases at the time. And that was a very privileged position to be in. So after that initial trial phase, Bowen settled into this pattern uh, back home of weekly infusions, which allowed him to get on with his life. He still spent a lot of that in hospital every week and our, our world and our planning revolved around those weekly infusions, which there was almost no way we would miss. So the world around revolved around that. And that continued for 11 years, but you know, he completed school he got his driver's licence and took himself off to university. And that was just fantastic. And that treatment gave him the health and the strength to engage in the world, study, we travelled, and he surrounded himself with a really good, strong circle of friends. And he was very much a contributor to society. Through all of this, we met some extraordinary people all over the world, but particularly, we've got a soft spot for Adelaide and the people here. We're constantly amazed at the work that gets done here at Semery and just the dedication and work to improving the lives of whoever they can is just um, means a lot to us. So, sorry. so in the 20 years, sorry, that he was with us, Bowie always maintained a positive outlook on life. Uh, he'd never let his disease define him or limit him. But importantly, he was proof tonight, importantly, he was proof that, that science and the work done here brings opportunities to improve the lives of others, and particularly those who are disadvantaged by no means of themselves. And critical to this <clears throat> is the ability to communicate that work out to governments, the regulators that we dealt with and we know the team dealt with, and just society as a whole to explain to them why this work is so beneficial to the people that need it, but in fact to us all, that those people get those treatments. So we look forward to hearing from Ben 
and uh, more on what we think is a really important aspect that goes along with the science, and that's the communication of the work that's done. Thank you. Thank you, David. <coughs> um, you've heard that it was a, a drug um, developed and, and discovered by John Hopwood and his team um, that gave Bowen back his life and gave um, Bowen back to Christina and to David, their family and friends. Uh, please now welcome John to the stage. It's great to see you all here <clears throat> and um, I think the most important thing I've got to say is about um, Bowen Oliver and how he, he, uh, he interacted with the team that was here in Adelaide. Bowen was a, a character that was uh, such a wonderful person and he liked, to, he was impish and he had lots of fun with all of the professional people around and I noticed David Ketteridge is still in the audience and David probably uh, has some fond memories of Bowen and how Bowen interacted with David and uh, had great delight in making him feel bad when he was taking a blood sample from Bowen. But Bowen, I must, I just wanted to touch on something that David said and Bowen was a great guy in communication. He wanted to, to communicate. He pointed out, he sat in my chair in my office over the children's hospital and he said, John, you don't communicate properly about what you're doing. And he went up to the, the whiteboard and started to write on it. And he, uh, he's very impish and he had a great character. And he said, um, you use too many big words. And what you need to do is just simplify the, your message. And, uh, you know, you've got me hooked and I know what you're doing, but you're not talking about it in, uh, in a way that that um, I think people in professions and people on the street and, and the, the people that fund your research would understand. And he, he immediately said he wanted to do something himself about communication between people, between professional people and between uh, the, the, the public and professional people and government and professional people and other professional people because we're really talking in silos and I think he had a great uh, passion about changing that. And this is what is the basis of the Bowen Oliver oration. I think we've started with, um, and I've got a list here, our first speaker and orator was a, a, a famous scientist known as Ian Fraser from Queensland. You can Google him, he's got a, a Z in his Fraser. Uh, and then John Shine is another scientist, but then we got stuck with scientists, uh, too, many, too, too many scientists using big words, and so we were advised and thought about Bowen's message that we should start broadening the oration selection. And so the next person was Robin Williams, and I'm not sure whether you remember Robin Williams, is an ABC communicator and talks about science on radio. And, and then we had Peter Greste, a foreign correspondent from, who was imprisoned in Turkey for, sorry, in Egypt for a year. And he was in the press many years ago now and, and was able to get back to Australia. But he's an amazing communicator about his area of, of, uh, of expertise. And then the next person was Alex Brown, who was the the theme leader in Indigenous Health here in Samri. And um, Alex was a great communicator but was frustrated by the, the reaction that he had from uh, all people he spoke to about Indigenous affairs and how well, things were not going right. This would have been 10 years ago or six, eight years ago. And then we had Carolyn Hewson, who was a board member and uh, she um, was a board member of a number of boards, big boards in Australia. And she was, uh, as Carolyn, the name gives her away a bit, she was the first female orator. 
and she described the problems of being female in a male-dominated area and how the problems you have communicating within that field. And then last year we had Callum McPherson, who was very busily informing us about men's mental health issues, and that was a very powerful uh, um, oration as well. And this year uh, we've got another orator that's along the lines that uh, that science has gone mad in the sense that it's trying to communicate with the world. And I hope that uh, I won't give him, I won't announce him now because I think Peter's going to do that for me later on. But uh, I think the trend is there and we want to make sure that the oration is in Bowen's name, is a, a memory of Bowen in the sense that he was such a wonderful, a impish guy, he had lots of fun, he liked to, to rubbish people about the way that they were very serious but not communicating. And I think if you relax a bit about your communication about something that's a very serious matter, then I think you start to get the point across. You don't use big words, you use heart, feelings from the heart about what you're doing. And I think this is a message we're trying to get deliver with the Bowen Oliver oration. So um, I'm, I'm not going to announce the, the 2023, um, because you already know who it is, but he's sitting right down here. But I'll let uh, Pete introduce him. But I just wanted to thank you all. And it's good to see some of the original team here uh, from so many years ago that where we worked over at the Children's Hospital over in North Adelaide to develop this wonderful drug that uh, several speakers have already talked about. And it really did make a big difference to Bowen. So, uh, and I, I really, um, I think the challenge for scientists, and I'll shut up in a minute, is that, that, that we must communicate more directly to people that make decisions about research, money in the research, and uh, make sure that the public owns the research that we, we do and that they can speak for us as well. So with that, I'll hand over back to Pete. Thank you. Thank you, John. Showing me a lot more courtesy than I showed to poor David earlier stealing his speech. Um, our oration tonight will be delivered by a man who I suspect, uh, had he had the chance to meet him, would have been fast friends with Bo and Oliver. Uh, I have the pleasure to work at Samri with Dr. Ben Lewis and can, to attest, can attest to his passion for science, but uh, also for pursuing new creative ways, as John has said, to uh, spread science stories to as many and as broad audiences as possible. Ben's a former research scientist uh, who worked in science media communications for over a decade across uh, writing, editing, public speaking, public speaking coaching, uh, radio, television um, and video production. He's now the science editor here at uh, Samri with our Lifelong Health theme, where he shares our people's research stories, but more importantly, gives them the tools for them to share their stories with their voice in their way. Please welcome Dr. Ben Lewis. I I don't know why I'm actually standing up here tonight, to be honest. My name's on the door, it's on the sign out the front, it's on the email that you all received. But see, this story's not about me. This story is about the scientists who stood up and said, the way that things have always been done aren't the way things should be done. The ones who uh, stepped out of their comfort zone and uh, took a punt and said, I can be better, I want to be better. They're the ones who matter and they're the ones who tonight is actually about. The ones who chose to take the step. For years we've talked about science communication uh, and the power of effective science communication. We need to get more science into society, we've said. 
And as scientists, you have a role in doing that. In fact, as scientists who take public funding, you have a responsibility to do that. And for a long time, the, uh, the focus of science communication has always been on that, talking to the public. Another whole element has been largely forgotten, which is the science communication within science to other scientists. And that is absolutely vital. Unfortunately, support for scientists when it comes to any form of science communication has been variable. And it's holding them back from both forms. That nice to have communication with the public and the absolutely critically important scientist to scientist. But that's what we're trying to change. We're creating at SAMRI, I think, a highly effective training program for scientists and people who work to support science to boost their communication abilities and their confidence. Tonight, I'm going to show you what we're doing and why it embodies Bowen's spirit. And most of all, I'm going to show you why it's needed. Because there is a massive gap in the way that we train scientists and, and people who work in science to communicate. And we're on a mission to plug that gap for the sake of the scientists, and science itself. So far, two cohorts of scientists have taken this big step and said, I want to be better at this. We can create it, and we, uh, but the important part is the people who take that step and what they can achieve. So who am I to be standing up here? Well, I'm Ben. Hi. If you wind the uh, clock back about 15 years, you would have found me in a research lab, as uh, Pete mentioned, doing a PhD in skin cancer biology and molecular pharmacology. And that's the track I thought I was on. Do my PhD, go do some postdocs, and develop my own research program. Pretty typical. Unfortunately, after uh, my PhD, my first postdoc job fell over just before I was meant to join when the uh, funding just disappeared. No job, nothing to do. Just had to start the search again. After a little while, I literally woke up one day and I was lying in bed and I thought, you know what, I actually like talking about science much more than doing science. I wonder if I can get paid to do that. So I took my big step and I changed path and I decided to focus on that science communication side of it. <clears throat> uh, and it was tough to change path, but it was, I needed to take that punt um, and it's because I realized it's what I wanted. Actually, no, 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 it's what I needed to do. And it was equal parts scary, seemingly throwing away everything that I'd worked for, sacrificed myself for for so long. But it was also relieving, that realization that a research lab career just wasn't for me. I was lucky. For me, it paid off, and I've been a professional science communicator for about 13 years now. Uh, I've worked in live events, video and documentary production, as a journalist, a writer, an editor. Uh, in, um, I've had regular spots on the ABC and commercial radio stations in, I think, every state and territory in Australia. Uh, and along the way, I've interviewed or worked with some amazing people like Brian Cox, Jane Goodall, Anne Druin, Alan Duffy, Dr. Carl, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, a whole bunch of astronauts, and a whole bunch of other amazing scientists and science communicators as well. I've even co-created, written, and produced a nationally touring science comedy stage show called The Science of Doctor Who in collaboration with the BBC. But at no point during my PhD was I set up for that path in communication. In fact, at no point during my PhD was I even set up to communicate what I was doing during my PhD. So when a, a science writer job here at Samri popped up, I jumped the opportunity, because I saw it as an opportunity, not for me, but to support the scientists who are working here and their communication. What can I teach you now to help you into the future? And the stars aligned, because not long after I started, one of my colleagues, Alexandra James, came to me and said, I want to start a rostrum group here at Samri, and I think you're the guy who can actually make it happen. And I said, what's a rostrum group? 
Turns out, it's basically a network of public speaking clubs around the country, an organization dedicated to helping people speak in front of audiences. Uh, and it was the perfect base for creating something tailored to the needs of Samri and the uh, scientists who work here. We ended up with Samri Rostrum, a twice monthly workshop program dedicated for scientists and people who work in science. Each session has a skill development workshops on topics including narratives, storytelling, presentation skills, confidence, the fundamentals of good presenting. And, uh, and then, uniquely, every session features participants give, who uh, give a prepared talk, either a short talk on an abstract topic or a longer scientific presentation. Andrew Downing is our official club coach, and he gives uh, detailed, in-depth, constructive feedback and encouragement to the presenters. So the sessions are this great mix of traditional workshop and, uh, and putting it into practice with the feedback to bring it all together. And it was a bit of a process to get it to, to this point, and there's some stuff that we did at the start that we don't do anymore. Uh, but what we've ended up with is, I think, an extremely effective public speaking presentation workshop program and probably one of the best in a health and medical research institute in Australia. So what makes Rostrum, uh, our Rostrum program so effective at teaching scientists how to communicate? There's five key elements. Number one, regularity. Two sessions a month, 18 to 20 sessions over the course of a year. And this is vital. Every time I've seen presentation workshops before, they're one workshop, maybe two. Very rarely do you see an ongoing program that builds on itself. But it's so important. You can build skills, but also the regularity lets you practice them over and over and over. By the end of each year, every participant has given at least two talks, and they've also hosted at least one of the sessions. It's that constant reinforcement and topping up of skills on top of any presentations they do away from Rostrum. Think about this. Pat Cummins doesn't just train once and then go out for a match. And he certainly didn't get that good without regular training. Element number two, skills. Yes, we focus on skills. Every session has an instructional workshop on one particular element of public speaking, delivered by people who actually know what they're talking about. One of the big problems with how scientists are taught at the moment is that uh, it comes from lab heads or other lab members. Now, some might be good presenters, but often it's just passing on bad habits. And so that's something I'll talk about a little bit later on. Together, Gabby, Andrew, and I have, let's just say, decades of experience of uh, public speaking at a high level. If it's not one of the three of us delivering that workshop, we bring in a guest speaker who's at the top of their game in one specific way. We also lean on our non-public speaking experiences, media, acting, teaching, singing. Not me, I'm a terrible singer. Number three, relevancy. Andrew and I have both worked in science and research. We've both worked in science communications, and we understand what makes science and STEM sing. And we talk from that dual experience. Participation. Every session has participants hosting the session and uh, and giving talks. And this is starting to get into why these sessions work so well. Participants prepare either a, either a short speech on an abstract topic or a longer scientific presentation, uh, and they give them to the group. We give them the chance to put what they're learning into practice uh, multiple times through the year. And then they get feedback from Andrew, and sometimes Gabby and myself. We break down in detail what worked, what could be worked on, and strategies for improving that talk. And the reason that that works is because of culture. This is the single biggest driver of improvement. We work very hard to establish a supportive, welcoming learning environment amongst that group. There's no ego, there's no judgment, just support and everyone there because they all want to improve. And that goes for the, all the instructors too. I'm always looking to uh, step up my game. So if I'm hosting and running one of the workshops, Andrew gives me feedback as well, in front of the group. No one is treated as if they're any better or worse than anyone else. As soon as you step through that door, you are there to improve. And that means it's a safe atmosphere for practicing and for experimenting. 
all of a sudden, people who would never stand in front of an audience uh, feel empowered and comfortable to do so. They speak up, they take risks, and they take that step they've always been afraid to take. It means that people who are more uh, confident and comfortable uh, speaking can push themselves, try new things, experiment, see what works and what doesn't. All of a sudden, everyone in that room is there for everyone else. It's a magnetic, electrifying atmosphere when you see everyone lifting the speaker further than even they thought possible. This is how you develop a program that actually works, that delivers what scientists need. The skills, and confidence, and the practice. They go hand in hand, and everything we do in those sessions is designed to build the confidence and the abilities of the participants, sometimes without them re even realizing. But myself, and Alexandra, Gabby, and Andrew, we can build all this, and I can stand up here and talk about preparing our scientists properly, about teaching uh, them how to communicate with impact. It still takes people to take that step and come. And I said at the start that this story is not about me. Because the people that matter in this are the people who take that step. For too long, too many scientists have just uh, kept going with the way that it's always been done. The people who matter are the ones who break out of that mold, who realize the importance of communication and the value of training themselves because it's so important. People like Corinne, an admin person for one of the research groups here, she could not stand in front of people and give a speech. I sat down and worked one-on-one -on -one with Corinne for quite a while before she did her first talk at Rostrum. Even in a room, just the two of us, she was nervous, unsure, visibly shaking at needing to stand and give a talk. So we talked about the structure of her message. We also talked a lot about her, about why she wanted to do this, about her story, and about what being able to give a talk in front of a group would mean for Corinne. I don't think anyone's going to forget her talk the next day. It was special because in that moment, everyone knew what giving that talk meant for Corinne. Seeing her achieve that goal meant that anyone could do it. But that's what happens in that room, in that special atmosphere and culture that helps the participants reach their goal, whatever it may be. Corinne left Samri a few weeks ago, and at her farewell, she stood to give a talk. Uh, she uh, thanked everyone and reflected on how she'd changed as a result of her time here. And in particular, that without her experience at Rostrum, she wouldn't have even been able to give a speech, a farewell speech, at, at her farewell. I was so proud of her. To see someone go from being able to speak to a, a situation so foreign, so intimidating, to then give that first talk at Rostrum in front of a group of 15 and then be able to give a thank you speech at her own farewell in front of a larger group. Seeing someone be able to take those steps for the first time, they're special moments. In Corinne's case, communication changed her life. Then there's Janelle. I don't think Janelle is particularly a shrinking violet, but she admitted to me she actively avoided giving presentations. But the Rostrum experience, that culture, that atmosphere, let her build that self-belief. Janelle is going to be a superstar. It's not just that she's now comfortable giving talks in front of audiences. She's genuinely outstandingly good. She has the potential to be elite. And we just would never have seen her otherwise. Then there's another researcher who emailed me to say that she was starting to realize that presenting her work could actually be fun. And another who is the quietest person I've ever met. And then just last month, won the most prestigious presentation prize in her field in Australia. And then there's Anita Lin. Anita is a nurse, cardiac care researcher, and a PhD student. With over 30 years of experience as a nurse, she's been the front lines of healthcare delivery. But she's another one who said, this could be better. So she's doing a PhD to improve how we look after cardiac, uh, sorry, cardiac patients in hospitals and the vital role 
that nurses play. That same attitude led her to Rostrum. She saw a vital need, the effective communication of her work to create real impact. We saw her, uh, and, and she thought she could be doing better than she was. We saw her build her skills, build her confidence, build her abilities, and like some of the others, find the fun in presenting. After a year of attending the Rostrum sessions, Anissa ended up being a university finalist at the Flinders University three-minute thesis competition. So, to give that talk to, uh, that took her to the final, please welcome to the stage, Anita. Thank you, Ben. What if you were a patient in my cardiac care unit? You would want to be treated by doctors and nurses who work together and consider your choices in the care that you want to receive. Now take a look at this picture. There is someone missing from the ward round. Where is the nurse? A nurse is not in the room. Now a nurse is there to advocate your needs to the ward round team and to make sure that they're involved in the decision making and that you understand your treatment plan. Now we have three different ward rounds like this going around every day but we only have one nurse available for all three ward rounds. And that nurse cannot be in three places at once. So, us nurses, we are so busy following hospital demands, delivering patient care, that we no longer get as many opportunities to be involved in decision making. And that leads to delays in patient care delivery. Did you know it takes so long for a decision to be made about recommencing a cardiac medication? We have to wake up our patients at midnight to give them their pills. Now, I wanted to make sure that our patients received the right care at the right time. So, I designed a ward round study. I wanted to improve patient participation and improve our workplace culture through situational awareness so that everyone gets a say and we aren't just listening to the most senior doctor's advice. So in my design, I made sure there was a nurse in this picture for all three ward rounds. And I gave them opportunities both inside and outside of the ward round so they could get together and update the treatment plans so that everyone was on the same page and that included the patient. I did this for 105 patients and I compared my results to my control group of 101 patients who are receiving routine care. Now my research showed that you can empower nurses to make effective decisions so that those patients did receive their pills before they went to sleep at night. They had less fasting because procedures were booked that bit earlier. They had less bed rest and more patient education. But there is more. I then checked 12 months later to see if we could sustain these benefits, if there was that culture shift. But unfortunately, we couldn't because there was still only one nurse for three ward rounds. So my research proves, oh no, my challenge is that I need to get the establishment to actually agree with me and to actually roster one nurse for each of the three ward rounds. But my research does prove that if you give a nurse the opportunity to make decisions and speak up on the ward round, then patients will receive quality care. So I hope if you were ever in my hospital, I hope not, but I hope if you were ever in this bed, that you have a nurse in the room, someone who will speak up so that you receive quality care at the right time. Thank you. It's great to watch you, amazing, fantastic talk. It's great to watch you speak, Anissa, because I can sort of see some of the things that you learnt in Rostrum that you've very much taken and put in your own spin on. It's one thing to take feedback and learn skills and do them. It's a very different thing to internalise it and make it your own, and that's, that's a real development. Um, we see you now, Anissa, but I guess, you know, a year before you hit that stage at that university final, what was, what was public speaking like for you? <laughs> well, uh, I was terrified. 
and uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I never really received any formal training in public speaking. I would do a lot of teaching and a lot of project work and presentations, but you know, I would always see the glazed eyes around the room. And I'd been to plenty of uh, scientific conferences and felt that way in the audience as well. Um, what made you decide to take that step to come to Rostrum? Okay, so I'm doing my PhD, mm -hmm. so I have to talk about it. And I don't want to be that boring person up on the stage. <laughs> and Rostrum came about, and I thought, oh, I think I'll, oh, good, you know, I've heard about Rostrum, mm. because I used to be in um, another club called Rataract, and I thought, oh, this is good, I'll, um, I'll learn how to do public speaking properly. <laughs> and what was that sort of like, um, you know, experience as, as a participant actually like? I loved Rostrum. Um, I still do. I wish I could come more often. Uh, so, <laughs> you said everything in your speech, actually. <laughs> So I felt really a warm welcome, I felt really comfortable, um, and I always felt like it was a safe place. It's just a safe place to get up there and have a go, because the feedback that you were given was, you know, it was, wasn't negative, it was all positive, and you felt like you were learning all the time, and you just had an opportunity to practice. And so what would you say now? Yes. What would you say to older Nita? Uh, old Anita, good on you for getting up there and having a go. Do not be afraid to get out of your comfort zone um, because we are always learning. You know, it never stops. And there's even more I need to learn about public speaking, and I know that, so um, I will continue to come when I can. Excellent. It's been absolutely fantastic to see you once again. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um, please join me in thanking Anita once more. <laughs>
it disadvantages us, the community. And that's why, it's, and it's a really important distinction to make, that public communication side versus the scientist to scientist. When people hear science communication, they usually think the first, very rarely do they think the second. But scientist to scientist is uh, arguably way more important because you do a lot more of that and you do a lot of it long before you even start thinking about talking to the public. So we need to train people to be better science communic communicators, not because we want them all to go out and start talking to the public, as nice as that would be. No, 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 no. We need them to be better communicators with each other. Which raises two problems. Firstly, even at that scientist to scientist level, most researchers aren't good. I'm sorry, but it's true. Anyone who's sat through any decent number of scientific presentations knows how bo boring they often are. And secondly, scientists aren't trained to communicate properly. And that's because our PhD system is set up wrong. It's failing our scientists, it's failing our, re and failing our research industry as a whole. It's not providing them with the knowledge or the skills that they need or the knowledge and the skills that research and industry wants them to have. I... Mm, stuff it. I'm just going to say this, and some, some of you may object to it. A PhD is not a research degree. Well, it is, but it shouldn't be. It should be a leadership training degree in the context of research. Think about it. For someone who uh, does a PhD, what's the expected track that they're going to follow? I mentioned this at the start. Do a PhD, broaden your experience with some postdocs, and start to develop your own research ideas and program. Gain funding for that program, have some people working on the program, eventually start your own lab group and become a lab head. Or get a job in academia, but that usually comes with a research program as well. Now, that's not everyone's uh, track, it's, but it's the expectation. It certainly wasn't my track, and uh, not everyone will progress all the way through that path, and that's fine too, but it's kind of the expectation. A PhD teaches that part up to uh, developing a research program. It's great for that, but it teaches none of the other skills needed for that entire uh, career pathway. It doesn't teach you how to manage a lab space, how to manage people, financials, how to sit on committee, how to teach, and it certainly doesn't teach you how to communicate what you're doing all the way through your career. And sure, it's not everyone's track. In fact, it can't be everyone's track. Over the past two decades, the number of PhD completions in Australia has grown from around 4,000 to 10,000 PhDs every year. But the number of academic positions in Australia has shrunk. From 2016 to 2021, the number of academic job, uh, jobs dropped from 54,000 to around about 46,000. And who knows what's going to happen here in SA with the university merger. Staying in research, well, research funding is just getting more difficult to come by. In health and medical research, the current success rates round about 9%. There's just not enough money for health and medical research in Australia. So while the expected track has stayed the same, the opportunities for doing so have reduced. And that's reflected in where PhD students are starting to expect to work. A 2019 national survey by the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute and the CSRO found that two thirds of PhD students in STEM fields were hoping to work in industry. When they get there, are they adequately skilled? The graduates themselves don't seem to think so. Researchers from Monash and Victoria Universities interviewed PhD graduates, finding that graduates said they were not well prepared for the job market outside academia. And that's because industry employers want skills needed for work, not publications and qualifications. PhD uh, graduates moving out of academia have had to retrain themselves. And I've heard several times, including an Economist article with the deliciously provocative title, Why Doing a PhD is Often a Waste of Time, business leaders complaining about shortages of high-level skills. Former Australian Chief Scientist Ian Chubb was militant about this. 
Australia has one of the lowest numbers of researchers in business enterprises amongst all developed nations, largely because businesses don't see the value in the skills that people with PhDs are bringing. The kicker is, most of the skills that industry needs and wants are the same ones that are required for that research track. So, if a PhD is setting up its graduates for either of those career paths, what's the point of a PhD? It's time to take a step and change the way we think about PhD programs. I've been saying this for years, and the Monash and Victoria University researchers came to the same conclusion. There needs to be a much higher emphasis placed on developing all of those other skills uh, during a PhD. Ian Chubb, as chief scientist, was even more explicit. He said, we need to restru uh, restructure doctoral education to include a broader skill set, which is currently neither mandated nor explicitly encouraged in the research sector. Our complicated world needs more. And of course, I'm a little biased, but communication skills must be absolutely central to that, because for me, it feeds all the rest of those skills. In fact, Daniel Webster, who was an American lawyer and Secretary of State in the 1800s, once said, if all my possessions were taken from me with one exception, I would choose to keep the power of communication. By for it, I would soon regain all the rest. Rostrum at Samri was born from a need. There is a significant gap in how we prepare PhD students, and resultingly, a massive gap in the uh, skills of our researchers. It was born from a need that scientists need, that intensive, directed, expert-guided uh, development program for communication. Because, as I said, it's vital for their career, and it's just not being delivered anywhere near well enough. The traditional attitude has always been, oh, they'll learn that from their supervisors. But their supervisors also haven't been trained properly either, which creates a couple of issues. Number one, no structure. You get ad hoc bits of instruction and feedback here and there, usually in front of your entire lab group. Number two, you're passing on bad habits, as I mentioned. And number three, and this is actually said to me by one of the uh, other professors here at Samri, you're continuing mediocrity. Think about it. If the person giving instruction and feedback is a scientist who gives that typical, uh, stereotypical scientific presentation of the type we've all seen a million times before, what's the end result going to be? But that's not even to mention that there's no standardization across an institute and that the feedback is always from your boss. Right? All of these elements reduce the effectiveness of that so-called training. The way it's always been done doesn't mean it's the way it should be done. And more people are realizing that. I know there's been some efforts to improve the training situation for PhD students and scientists. Uh, the ATN group of universities have an online platform with short video content uh, which, uh, on a lot of the things that we've talked about tonight. And UniSA is beginning to implement a more structured program. However, it's always going to be on the side rather than a key component of what a PhD program is. In most cases, if institutions do run workshops, the vast majority are one off, maybe two, which doesn't allow any actual developing of skills, practice, and feedback. We've talked about this already, and we've talked about the structure that we use at Rostrum and how the regular sessions build on the skills, but they also provide that practice to practice in a safe, oh, so the opportunity to practice in a safe space and receive quality feedback from professionals. That's where you get benefits. But you just don't see it. And that's where a program like Rostrum comes in. The years of talk about scientists needing to be better communicators. By taking it seriously, by developing a program, our scientists and staff have the real opportunity to improve. When you set up a, a workshop program, do you have any idea how valuable it can be for reputation? Samri Rostrum has had requests to join from researchers not affiliated with Samri at all. Women's and kids, Adelaide Uni, even SA Health down at Flinders. As words getting out, people at other institutions are looking at Samri and thinking, that's what I want. 
So it's time that more institutions started taking this seriously. No, we probably aren't going to be able to rebuild PhD programs overnight. Oh, so, uh, we're not going to be able to rebuild PhD programs, certainly not overnight, but we can start training students and staff properly. Build that culture of development. Build more of these programs that have real value and opportunity, especially for communication, because not only does it have uh, benefits in terms of knowledge sharing and research impact, but when researchers or anyone goes out uh, and presents, it reflects on the institution. Imagine this, all of a sudden in the conference, every summary researcher is giving exciting, engaging, interesting, informative presentations, and everyone at that conference is sitting there thinking, geez, those people from summary are impressive. It acts as a lightning rod to attract attention. You can use it to attract the, uh, the best students. We will turn you into so much more than just another scientist. We'll turn you into a leader. By developing your team properly, by taking it seriously and making it part of the fabric of the place, you increase the value of your, uh, the impact of your research, you increase the uh, reputation of your institution, and you increase the success of those staff where they are or where they go next. I once had a manager who said something which has really stuck with me. He wasn't even trying to impart knowledge, it was just in conversation. But he said, my job as a manager is to prepare you properly for your next job. If you're not moving onwards and upwards, that's on me. That's an attitude that's being missed too often. Everyone is sitting in this room because they largely agree with Bo and Oliver's philosophy. The power of communication to change and improve lives and society. So let's do it properly. Let's make the changes we need to make. We can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. Rather than just say, scientists need to go out more, just go out, get out and communicate more. Let's set them up for success. Let's empower them to overcome their fears, uh, build their skills, and share the knowledge they're doing so well at generating. Because we can only change society if communication is effective. So, to universities, institutes, Let's train our people properly. What do scientists need in five years' time, 10 years, 20 years? Let's get them there. Let's be strategic. Let's make sure it's part of the culture of the organization so that people feel empowered, supported, comfortable, and yes, even compelled to devote real time to developing their skills beyond just research. And to scientists, it's time to take the step. There are some of us working within the system to create the opportunities because the need is there. And whenever I talk to you, any scientists, I can see that the desire is there as well. There's a lot of us wanting to see you build and be the best, uh, most successful versions of yourselves. We believe that you can get there. We wouldn't be putting in this effort if we didn't. But you still need to take the step yourself. At the end of the day, it's still up to you. Do you want to make an impact in your field? Yes. Do you want to make an impact in the world? Yes. Do you, want, uh, do you think you can play a part in improving society? Yes. Then let's do it. We'll do it together because I'm with you on that. I want to see you be the best version that you can be. And I want to see your work have the most impact it can possibly have. Tonight isn't about me. Tonight is about Anita, Corinne, Janelle, Jackson, Victoria, Ash, Laurent, Tim, Julian, Noah, and all the others, and I can't name them all, who have taken that step. The ones who had that vision to change a discussion, change an audience, change society. The ones who are willing to start doing something about it. And it could, and it should, be you too. Taking the first step is hard. Finding the time is hard. It's hard. But ask yourself tonight, what's the step you're going to take to make sure what you do changes the world? Thank you.
Martin for an amazing presentation. Um, I think we can see a lot of similarities with both presentations really. There's a problem identified, there's analysis of the problem and there's a solution. Um, unfortunately, it looks like common sense to us but uh, common sense is never as common as we'd all hope it be. Um, but I guess through the tools that Ben's working on to equip people with here at SAMRI, um, that's really all we can do is ensure that we can present those solutions as, as clearly and succinctly to the people that are making the decision so that um, we can walk on a better path. Um, so thank you, Ben. I'd like to call uh, David and John back to the stage just to make a little presentation. Um, <clears throat> ben, sorry, I'd just like to say that that was spot on. What's the point of science if no one knows about it? And Bowen benefited from, sorry, from all of that science and uh, if people hadn't talked about it, John and his team hadn't gone out and actively dealt with it and dealt with people, we wouldn't be here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Reiterate, um, we've had a wonderful example from Ben about the power of communication. And if you think about all of the previous orators that have gone uh, over the last 10 years for the Bowen Oliver Orator title, uh, it's just truly amazing that we've got to this point where we've identified specific communications. You need to have that uh, dedication, relevance, and thrill of what the message you're giving to the audience that you're giving it to. It could be a, uh, a high class administrator, it could be a, uh, a person handing out the money in, in the NHMRC, or it could be the public who really own what is being done in, here in Samri. And I think we've got to view the public as a very special audience for us. And that's something where we could improve our communication skills in doing that. Now, for 2024, um, I'm very pleased to announce, and I'm personally chuffed, and obviously it's an old word that I used to use, but I think chuffed is the real feeling that I have about the person who's going to give the 2024 oration. And that person is Professor Steve Wessling. And uh, Steve is very excited. He was involved. For those of you who don't know Steve, and I guess there wouldn't be many in this audience, Steve was the inaugural uh, 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 chief um, of this, this institute here, uh, and that was uh, in October 20, 2011. He was appointed as being the inaugural executive director of SAMRI. And, and Steve had the great skill of bringing everyone together. He was a great, he still is a great communicator, but he's moved on to other places, mainly in Canberra and Sydney now. And um, I'd like to let you know that, uh, if you don't know already, he's recently been uh, chair of the NHMRC, appointed chair of the NHMRC Research Committee, director of the NHMRC Council, and president-elect of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Science Limited. And so he's in a very different position than he was here in Samri. He has a greater influential position, and I hope his communication skills keep, uh, keep up to uh, the standard he showed here, because he's got a very telling audience to deal with, I think, in getting the message across about how important medical research is in our community and to deliver what the community needs. And so uh, I'd like just to say a few words. Congratulations, Steve, the very wonderful process that you've, you've taken us from October 2011 to now coming back in 2024 to tell us about communication skills that got you where you were uh, then and where you are now in 2024. So I'd just like to make sure that that's fully announced and I'm very pleased and I, I said chuffed to think that Steve Wessling is going to be the 2024 uh, Bowen Oliver orator. So that I'll finish on, and it's a great thing.